Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to our webinar tonight about uh, green waste management uh, with Brian Kappa from Chip Drop. So uh, I am not Brian Kappa. I am Kale Royer from Tree Stuff. Um, I've got a couple things to talk to you about first, and then actually uh, we're going to get started with a quick video on some of the awesome stuff that has come out uh, at the beginning of 2024 uh in the arborist industry so uh we'll play that in a second here um uh, really really cool stuff and then we'll get right into brian so uh first up i want to say that we've got a couple things going on that is uh we have an event coming up in april which is a tucson arizona tree step party i am looking for new party hosts so uh tree stuff parties are great events uh where uh, any arborist from the area can come out, uh, hang out, meet other arborists, try out some uh, cool gear up in the tree. A uh, lot of fun, uh, totally free for everybody involved. Uh, and we send in some gear uh, that you guys can try out while you're there. Uh, so we do need hosts for that. Um, you can sign up to be a host, uh, or you can uh, apply to be a host at treestuff.com slash parties. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll contact you and we'll get something set up. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, coming up is actually just uh, that you need to go and check out all of these cool new items that we have uh, on the website right now from a bunch of different uh, people. Some of them actually just came out today, fresh, hot off the presses. So uh, we're going to switch on over to Nick at his desk with all the cool stuff. Hi, I'm Nick Bonner for TreeStuff.com. We're here today to show you some of the newest items for 2024 in the Arborist market. Let's take a look. Now, this first item right here is the Notch Swinger. I'm pretty excited about this one. I worked with the engineer, Micah, to invent this product. And one of the things that we looked at when we were bringing the tool holder into existence was how does the tool holder work? How do people use it? And as much as you put things on a tool holder, you also take them off. So the Swinger's got a locking gate. You can see here, it's going to keep it shut. It's also going to allow us to open. What sets the swinger apart from all the other tool holders is that the gate actually opens out the other direction. This lets you put an item onto it very easily and take it off by simply pulling against that spring pressure. It's pretty strong. You can see even holding this Rock Exotica Transporter XL, another brand new tool holder we're going to talk about here in a second, the, the gate's not going to open up. So if you go upside down or something like that, you are still going to be able to, to hold the item on there. So is there a way you to make can... sure that it doesn't come out? No matter yeah, what you have in there? Yeah, absolutely. So you can just lock it. You can just lock it shut like this, and then no amount of pulling is going to, going to make it come out for sure. So if you are if you know you're going to go like upside down or something, I mean, look, this is a pretty steep angle. Normally, a climber's back would be like this, in which case an item is going to fall right into the nose there. And even if it's unlocked, it's not going to come out. Most people rarely get past, you know, an angle like this when they're when they're climbing. That's a couple cool. other really, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, a couple other really cool features. You've got this nice uh, connection down here. You can use this for either the dead end of your lanyard or to put a chainsaw lanyard on. Uh, and then it's got four screws right here. So you see it's going to clamp on. Uh, and it's got a nice wide webbing channel. So it's going to clamp on to pretty much anything uh, you want to get it onto. Really excited about the Swinger. Uh, this is a patented product, and uh, I think it really innovates in a space where we haven't seen a lot of innovation uh, in, a, in a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take a look at what's next. Uh, this is the Ratchet Scrunch. We did a separate video on this. This is a really nice uh, scrunch. You know, you think about a wrench, what is it? How special could it be? Um, this has the, the socket sizes to fit both your steel and Husqvarna style saws. It's got a really simple bracketing me mechanism here to flip directions and a very uh, simple uh, chromed flathead screwdriver right here. So uh, just an easier way to, to get your <clears throat> bar nuts on or off. We actually sold out of this item. We sold through the entire first order in like three days because everybody was like, oh, I want to get a new ratchet scrunch because this one looks sweet. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. It really is. Yeah, it's, it's well made. It's made here in, in the United States. Love that about it. Uh, small, small kind of business guy making this. 
really, really cool product. So that's the Ratchet Scrunch. Uh, next thing I want to talk about, so Rock Exotica uh, Enforcer XL. This is the biggest tool holder on the market. Transporter uh, XL. What did I call it? You call it the Enforcer, which is a like $4,000 product. <laughs> You're right. You're right. It's not that much. Uh, no, this is this is the <clears throat> Transporter XL. Thank you, Kale. Uh, this is the biggest tool holder on the market. You know, the Transporter is the best seller, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They've done extremely well. They made a really robust, uh, durable product uh, with a simple locking mechanism. Look at that gate clearance. I mean, that is huge. You could almost fit the swinger inside of this gate clearance. It's so big. Uh, really um, a very cool product. Uh, if you're doing a lot of rigging slings or you find that you're just running out of space uh, on your standard size tool holders, the Rock Exotica Transporter XL uh, is a really logical, I think, continuation for this product line. It's very cool. I think we're going to see some other brands probably foraying into larger tool holders uh, as well. This, one's, this one uh, looks really nice. Next, I want to talk about uh, the Camp Gyro. I think everybody's been looking at this over on the desk. When's he going to start talking about that? This is I, by far the coolest lanyard hard, hardware that I think I've seen in ever, maybe, really long time. Um, it almost feels, it, yeah, it's just awesome. It almost feels like too nice for camp. Like this is the nicest thing I've ever seen camp make. It is so cool. Uh, let's talk about it kind of from the from the this way up. So we've got a pretty standard carabiner here. The swiveling mechanism on these, Kale, if we can show this, um, mm -hmm. it, this is the best in the business. Nobody makes a swivel better than camp's gyro one swivel. It is Dead nut simple. You can see the entire inside of it. There's nothing to break. There's no bearings involved. Uh, you know, it can't freeze or lock up with mud. Um, best swivel on the market. I think the Camp Gyro 1, maybe Kale will bring that up in a little bit. That's the product we've had for a while. That's just a single swivel like this. Definitely nicest swivel made. Moving on up into the lanyard uh, componentry of it, you see there's articulation right here, which is pretty neat. That allows as your tending the slack to, to really lift the whole thing up. There's also articulation independently just in the pulley. I think that's just them kind of like dunking because I'm not even sure that's really necessary with the articulation here, uh, but it sure is cool. Um, but what really sets the gyro apart is the fact that they've separated the anchoring point for the Prusik to be on the opposite side of the swivel. So if you, Think about a normal like, swiveling lanyard. If you were to put a swivel on a Prusik-based lanyard, since the Prusik is connected to the carabiner here, there it actually can't swivel, right? So by connecting the Prusik up here with this kind of bolted system, you can see they've actually bolted the Prusik on here with this little Torx connection, little star T there. Um, they've made it so that the entire lanyard can swivel independently of the harness, so it's never going to get tangled. It's also a really nice Prusik cord. And what's really cool is that this hollow bearing here, in addition to looking sweet, allows you to come right back to it and set up in a double rope, in a double rope, uh, <clears throat> in a double rope format here. Sorry about that. Um, last thing I want to look at on this lanyard, which is really cool, uh, is this termination here. This is a piece of uh, webbing it's actually tucked inside of itself. It's kind of like spliced inside of it on the end of the rope, sealed with a little rubber grommet kind of deal here, and then stitched through here. Uh, we've seen some other companies look at ways to try and simplify rope terminations, to make them smaller, make them slimmer without hand splicing. Uh, this is the best one that I've seen yet. Uh, it looks really good. It looks really strong and trustworthy. I really like this. Uh, I'm keeping this lanyard. I was supposed to send this to somebody else after I made this video and it's not happening. So uh, Mark and Sam, you're gonna have to just tell people to watch this video uh, because I'm keeping this. This is really nice. Uh, kudos to the camp team. Let's see what's next. Uh, this is the Magneto. This is really cool. This is uh, an accessory for the Rope Runner Pro. And I, I meant to have a Rope Runner on this. Uh, I'll do a separate video where I actually show how to install this, but uh, the keeper on the rope runner, you might recognize this. It kind of looks like the keeper. Um, this is the part that's going to go inside the rope runner where the slick pin is going to go through it. And instead of having another eye like this, yeah, there we go. Kale's showing it. 
So you see this carabiner here becomes the bending part, you know, but mm -hmm. it's like a, have you ever heard of Fidlock? It's kind of like Fidlock in that it, you just, all you have to do is get it close and it's going to click in there and then you lift up, it's going to orient so that this little collar here, I don't know if you can see that, this little collar here, Kale, yep. catch it. Yeah, see, catches that. Uh, and then when you want to disconnect from it, all you have to do is just push it off and you leave this piece connected to your chest harness kind of mm. full time. And then this is, this lives on the, on the rope runner pro. So I love, I love what you did with my hands here. <laughs> this kills me. <laughs> it's like they're teleporting. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so yeah, this is the Magneto. This is an inexpensive accessory. If you have a rope runner pro, you definitely uh, need this. This is better than the out of the box tending solution uh, by a mile. Two items left, Kale, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap this video up. But I want to talk about Guardian Angel. Guardian Angel is so cool. There's a whole line of products. This is the bigger one. There's also a smaller, the Guardian Angel Micro. It's about this big, maybe a little smaller. Um, and what these are is they're uh, they're visibility tools. Uh, they come in a variety of colors, and they have all these buttons on them. And I'll show you what they do here. You can individually uh, control the rear and front lights. You can also do like a little SOS blinker that's probably kind of useless or like just turn on a like a red light like this. But uh, essentially all of these things combine to form uh, kind of a beacon platform here uh, that is just really super duper visible and you can do just the fronts, right? Or just the rears or turn on like a static front and a blinking rear, whatever you want to do. Uh, but these come with strap mounts. They come with a cone mount, which you can mm -hmm. put out in front of your cone taper, Kale. Uh, and uh, really cool stuff. Um, great battery life. And it's this is that uh, like black, like glass impregnated nylon stuff. Uh, I've talked. We've talked about this in a few videos. This is like the coolest yeah. material. Super durable. You could just take this thing, and you know, it doesn't matter. It's gone. Did you see that? It like fell through my desk. Uh, that's not what happened. I threw it over my shoulder. Yeah. Here are uh, some of the uh, the different mounts that you've got. This yeah, is the one that goes the... uh, in there. And when you connect the light to these mounts, um, it's magnetic, right? That's right. Let me grab it. Let me see if I can find it here. Or yeah, there's a big it. magnet on here, and all the different mounts magnet connect to it. You can, you see with these bosses here, you can screw them into any of the mounts for like a permanent accessory. But this essentially just slaps on, and it's one of those rare earth magnets. So, like when it hits, it's like, Poof! Let's see everything I got here. Oh yeah, there it is. See, yeah, that's just a little, like a little bolt in the downrigger that it's connected to there, which is a nice segue. Uh, let's talk about the downrigger, and then I think actually we have like a list of products that we wanted to show. Kale, are mm -hmm. we ready? Are we ready to do that? We have a bunch. Yep. There's so much new stuff I couldn't fit it all on my desk, but. This is the Rock Exotica Downrigger. This was invented by a good friend, uh, Jamie Merritt, uh, who also invented the Akimbo. Um, and this device is just as slick as the Akimbo, uh, but for rigging. Uh, you see it's on the platform of the standard kind of Omni block from Rock Exotica. That's a really burly swiveling platform. And what this does is uh, it allows you to use two different brake hands to control a rope that you're uh, using for rigging. So you can put uh, up to 300 pounds of weight on here and use it like a porter wrap in the tree that you're able to uh, control. See, it's got a little swiveling cam here. A little bit of motion helps pinch the rope. And then the friction from the brake uh, allows you to stop the item. So this is the Rock Exotica Downrigger, easily the smallest uh, and nicest entry into a growing category of aerial friction devices. Uh, Really well-made stuff, of course, from Jamie and the crew at Rock Exotica. Uh, Kale, want to show us some of the other new items? <clears throat> sure, we can do that. Uh, first up here, we've got the Samson V-licious line. This is nice. This is an exclusive. We have this just at our vertical supply group stores, and it is uh, four colors, 11.4 millimeters. This is a really, really light double braid. Comes in four cool colors mm -hmm. and uh, two lengths. It's pretty neat. Um, this one's your favorite. These are so ugly. Uh, <laughs> I know. I I would not wear real tree camo. I'm just going to tell you guys that it's okay. If you like real tree camo, I still like you. But I'm not. Okay, that's pretty cool. But 
<laughs> this is not for me. I mean, they're cool looking. Oh, all right. That's cool too, I guess. I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, okay. I'm still not going to wear that though. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's cool. It, it is authentic real tree. So yes. like if that's the thing, if you're into authentic real tree, uh, you can, oh geez. Oh, you can, um, you can get them here at treestuff.com yep. with class one UL chainsaw protection, which yeah. is pretty sweet. And these are the, the breathe flex pro, which are kind of the, the standard from, uh, from Arbor tech right now, Jason Dudek, you need this orange yes, real tree pair for yep. sure. Uh, if, if uh, Jason is watching, let's see. Uh, I'm sure he is. Um, he's probably also pretty oh, excited. Oh, the Rope Runner Pro Orange. About this Oh, puppy. and look at that. My search index this morning worked. That's great. That mm -hmm. would have been embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, Get out did. of here with your Honey app, bro. Oh, sorry. There we go. I don't know. There's no coupons. No, it doesn't do anything <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so that's, you know, same Rope Runner Pro. It's just in a hot awesome. orange color, just for Jason Dudek, just one of our for super Jason. fans. He's What's next on the list? We okay. have a ton of new stuff. Uh, we Plus have more hedge trimmers. Yeah, a couple different hedge trimmers. Um, <clears throat> I've just chosen two here. Uh, these are the full like gas power professional ones. There's also the uh, pro ones that are the, the e jobbers. Yeah, the super long, uh, thirteen foot hedge trimmers. Uh, so those are all available under saws and pruners, hedge trimmers. Um, that's sweet. Yeah. So that's what the last thing you want to be doing is taking like a hand hedge hand shear and putting it on a pole with a ratchet strap. <laughs> yeah. I have definitely uh, maybe done that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the dino saw, this is cool. We actually learned about this product when we were visiting Aorid. We just did a webinar for them. Uh, which is available on the YouTube channel um, where we show all of their rope manufacturing. But this is the Dinosaw ABS uh, strop. This is a chainsaw lanyard, and it has uh, a shock absorber built into it, but it's really slim. It's not like one of the thicker packs. It's, it's about this thick and just built into the end. If you do drop your saw or if your saw gets snatched, like in a, a barber chair cut or something like that, um, this is going to help dissipate that force that might get applied to your body. Uh, which could suck. Apparently, we've also sold sold out of these as well. <laughs> yeah, really quickly. This new stuff. People are on it, man. Mm -hmm. They are on it. This is great. We probably need to combine this with the other PDP kill. That's my bad. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, we'll work on that. But yeah, this, this is, is the uh, Edelwood Shield cool. Two um, that we've just got a cool new color in. Uh, the other ones, if you have it, some older kids, maybe. Uh, aren't as cool because they have like a bug pattern on it. So this is just kind of uh, neater for the more a little bit grown up climbers. And if you are an extremely small headed person, yeah, you might uh, find some respite here. Uh, mm -hmm. This is an approved, uh, you know, kind of hard hat and uh, is a great helmet. Uh, I have one of these for my kids. Yeah, I love it. This is not new. But it is back. So this is Yale Prism. This was originally a Canning's color, if, if that means anything to you, like 10 years ago. Um, but now it is uh, generally available from Yale. Uh, Yale Prism, 11.7 millimeter. This is kind of in that blue moon family, uh, really high quality rope and uh, an OG classic color. I'm excited to see this back in in, uh, in full production here. Hi, Wells. <laughs> Is, uh, that's He's on son. the other side of the house. That's Kill's son. Samson Dry Vortex. So this is the same Vortex rope that we already sell, but with Samson's new Samson Dry technology. So this makes the entire rope hydrophobic. No water is going to come into this rope. It won't absorb the water. Like the water would pass. It. Technically, it's kind of like passes right through it. So yeah. uh, going to keep your rope drier and cleaner and actually stronger because as it gets wet, it does lose some of its breaking strength. Mm -hmm. Not that that really matters, but. Also helps with, uh, with yeah, with lasting longer, just has a, a lifespan as well. My favorite feature is it just makes the rope lighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a weird thing. That's, all right, 
the Tell cast, us about the Primero. The Cask Primero is uh, the newest in Cask's line of lightweight helmets. Uh, it's got the nice foam interior. Uh, it's kind of got a feel more like the Super Plasma um, and the size and everything, but it works with all of the Cask Zenith um, attachments, uh, the visors and things like that that you can get for it. Uh, so you can use it um, with things with the kind of the newer line of things that they're coming out with. Whereas the super plasma has a couple different oddities about right. uh, the accessories. There's also an air version that isn't. Hmm? The Zenith accessories are much nicer. Yes. They are. They're, they're really nice. Um, the Primero air is the non-class E rated. Um, it's, you know, same thing. Uh, and these are made in America. That's right. That's right. They're actually so. made uh, in uh, America, in between North Carolina and Chicago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yep. And then the last thing that we're probably the thing we're These most are nuts. About. And before you think we're crazy, we sell a ton of these, <laughs> believe it or not. People keep buying them. Uh, but these are like technically like weight accurate mannequins and they're durable and uh, they're they're really serious. Uh, they're extremely expensive, but uh, professional rescue operations, SAR, firefighters, uh, are the people buying these things. If you are doing an aerial rescue every year and you just want to make an investment in something that's definitely going to last, uh, you can check that out. Uh, we do drop shipping. Uh, it'll take a minute, but the Ruthly Technical Rescue Mannequin Gen 2 uh, is a super cool item. Kale, let's close just by talking about the Swinger one more time. I want to give it another a shameless plug as it is. Uh, but yeah, the notch, the notch swinger. So excited about this. I want to give uh, a lot of props to Micah. Uh, maybe Kale can even pop the patent up, but Micah was the engineer who brought this to life and he fought with this thing uh, for years to make this gate, for literally two years, uh, to make this gate return to true every time and pass uh, an advanced wear test. Look at that, 2042. Nobody else gets that dual action gate. We did it first. Really proud of the work that Micah put in to make this thing happen. I think when people start, you know, thinking about having textiles and, you know, how hard it is sometimes to, you know, bend the textile off. It's easy with the stiff rope, but, uh, you know, the ability to, to pull something off like this uh, is really cool. Uh, get the locking barrel so it's going to lock both ways. And while not in the official usage, there is a cool kind of like hack with this. You can do this where you lock the gate on the inside and that's going to let an item in, but it doesn't let an item out. Or you can lock it on the outside, which is going to let an item out, but isn't going to let a twig or something like that in. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty neat, right? That's, that's not like in the official uh, IFU as it's called. Um, but uh, that is a, a pretty neat hack. So, uh, congratulations uh, to Micah. Uh, really appreciated working with you and bringing this item out. Uh, super excited to see it as part of the Notch assortment. It really came out uh, great. Now, everybody go buy one because they're probably going to sell out soon, I would imagine. Thanks for watching. Kale, thanks for putting this together. I really loved this format. Uh, and this is our new items for 2024. Maybe we'll do this again. Hi, I'm okay. Nick Bonner for TreeStuff.com. Right. We're here today to show you some of the... There we go. I hope okay. everybody enjoyed that. Uh, that is uh, a quick rundown of all the cool new stuff that we have uh, happening right now. Uh, stuff. So, uh, without further ado, um, oh, also, yeah, if you if you have any uh, any more questions about any of that stuff, go ahead, throw it in the chats there, um, and I can answer as Brian gets started. So, I'm gonna turn it on over to him and. We can get this going on the last Brian. And are you having problems with the screen share? No, I'm good. Uh, let me start that. Sorry, I wasn't. Uh... Okay. All right, perfect. I'm good. All right. And without further ado, Brian Kappa of Chip Drop. Hey, everyone. I'm Brian Kappa. As Kale mentioned, thanks for the intro. Uh, thanks to Tree Stuff for 
hosting me and putting on these webinars. It's a really cool thing they do. And yeah, we're happy to be here and uh, presenting uh, what's hopefully some useful information for yourself, uh, your company. It's sort of geared towards folks who own and operate their own company. But even if you don't um, have your own company, there still should be some useful information that'll be helpful for you when you're uh, you know, working with uh, all the green waste material that you generate when you're working out on the job. So yeah, um, just a little intro about ChipDrop. And uh, so ChipDrop is a service that I started back in 2015. Um, we started here in Portland, Oregon. It helps tree companies find places to get rid of their wood chips and logs. So mostly we work with homeowners, uh, just residential gardeners, folks who are willing to take the wood chips and the logs from tree companies. Maybe a lot of folks sort of do that on their own or we're doing that on their own and we kind of just created an app for it to make it more efficient. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a one-stop shop for homeowners. They put in a request on our website. We have a lot of terms and expectations that they have to agree to um, and they can put a lot of information in into the site that describes where they want the wood chips, all the details that you'd basically need to know if you're going to show up there. And we collect all that information, store it. And then, yeah, whenever your truck is full and you need to deliver some wood chips, you can pull up the uh, the web app and, uh, and just drop sort of on demand whenever you need to. Um, and that's kind of how it works. We'll go into a little more details during the webinar, but, but yeah, um, chip drop, operates nationwide all over the country. We also operate in Canada, uh, the United Kingdom as well, and a little bit in Australia. So technically it's an international company, which we think is kind of cool. But uh, but yeah, it's been growing um, with a lot of uh, help from Tree Stuff, um, doing some partnerships, things like this. So yeah, it's it's been really fun running this. And my background, um, just so you know, where I'm coming from is a, uh, my background's in engineering, but I did work for a tree company for a couple of years, mostly just hauling brush and running ropes and stuff like that. I never climbed on the job, um, although I have done some recreational climbing. So yeah, I'm definitely familiar with uh, tree company operations. It's how the idea for chip drop came about. And so just over the last 10 years, really just kind of learning the ins and outs of um, some of this stuff, I wanted to share some knowledge. So, um, and full disclosure, if you're an experienced uh, tradesperson in your craft, you may know way more than me. So uh, take the pieces that are useful to you and ignore the stuff that um, that you already know. Um, and yeah, hopefully everyone will learn something. So without further ado, um, let's see here. Get my screen share working. There it goes. So what is green waste? Um, I'm using the term green waste. Uh, you might say wood waste. Um, basically, it's all of the woody plant material that you're processing at your job. So it doesn't matter if you're just throwing branches into the back of a trailer or if you're chipping it uh, or if you're hauling logs, all that stuff is kind of what we're talking about here. So. Uh, can you not see the presentation? Oh, I went into presentation mode and, um, sorry about that. Now, what do you see? Oh man, we practiced this, Kale. Well, if, if you guys don't mind, I'm just gonna present from this screen. It's a little easier and we're gonna be flipping back and forth through tabs. So is that too clunky, Kale? Does that seem tacky? Hold on a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try one. Oh, you're gonna crop it? I'm gonna try one more time. Sorry, bear with us, everyone. Um, we're gonna stop screen share. Go over here. Yeah, that's to trick us. Um, okay, let me try this. Oh, I know what it is. Sorry, give me. I, I know what happened. I'm gonna try something else. We almost have it. 
We almost have it. Professional. We've got the top people on the job. Okay. All right. Something. You're seeing something. We're seeing something. We're seeing green waste management for tree companies. Remember, you can see me. Yeah. If you can't see. Yeah, there we go. All right. We're working. I think I see what everyone else is seeing. So yes. anyway. Perfect. Uh, so what is green waste? Yeah, it's the brush that you're working with. It's wood chips, logs, leaves. If you do lawn care, technically it would apply to grass, although it's not really what we're talking about here necessarily. But um, yeah, rakings, anything, any organic material that you put in the back of your truck. We'll leave that at that. Um, so yeah. Um, and why does it matter? Why do you need to think about this? Well, uh, the thing we're going to focus on really in this is um, cost. It costs your business money. Um, and we'll talk about how much um, it costs your business time. You have to deal with the material that's in your trailer or your truck, or you can't keep working. It fills up. Um, it's a lot different for the tree care industry, I think, than a lot of other industries. Um, although there are waste materials, um, I think the tree care industry and maybe landscaping in general generates a lot. So it's probably a much bigger portion of the business expenses. Um, and yeah, it takes time to deal with that material. Time costs money, it takes up space, um, which costs money. It takes up space in the truck, in the chip, in the uh, trailer. If you are keeping the wood chips or taking it back to your yard, then it takes up space in your yard. So a lot of space, a lot of volume. Um, like I said, it can stop your crew from working. If the truck has to leave to go empty their chips, the longer they're gone, the longer your crew is sort of sitting around, um, maybe piling up brushes to chip later, but you know, maybe they just have to stop altogether. So, um, and green waste management, you know, has legal implications. There's quarantines in different cities, um, in your area, in your state, certain pest control management procedures that you have to be aware of when you're dealing with this material. So, um, we're just going to kind of talk about some of that. So what are your options for disposing of your green waste? Um, you can take it to a landfill or a transfer station, um, which uh, depending on where you live, that may mean that it gets uh, resold as mulch. It may mean that it gets composted. It may mean that it just goes into the landfill with all the other trash. It really depends on how your municipality handles uh, green waste, but it is an option. Most uh, municipalities will take green waste. Uh, your city or county may be a little more sophisticated. They may have like uh, an actual depot where you can take it to, or they may allow a permit or just allow you to take it directly to uh, public parks. Um, you definitely want to talk with your city before you just go dropping off wood chips at parks, but it is a material they use to mulch pathways and all that. So it's a place you could consider. And I'm presenting all these options just as a way to say, um, knowing that this is a large expense for your company, you may find something in here that works for your specific application and, and find that this is the cheapest, most affordable way for you to get rid of your wood chips. Uh, so, you know, with a little bit of legwork, calling around your city, county, you may find a really good option uh, for you. Um, biomass energy facility is another option. Um, I heard about this actually from some folks in the UK who said that um, uh, certain biomass energy operators, these are places that burn wood and woody material for energy, um, will actually uh, pick up the material and pay for it. I don't know if there's any places in the US uh, that are doing that, um, but you could do a quick Google search and see, and that could be a really cool option. Um, everyone that I've heard of, you uh, or the folks I was talking with in the UK said that um, you had to store the material and they picked it up, but maybe there's a place that will take it and you can drop it off and maybe it's close uh, and convenient. Uh, developing a farm or agriculture relationship, maybe there's a blueberry farm near you that just can take endless wood chips. Um, or a horse ranch or somewhere. Um, if you live in a rural area, that could be an option. Uh, schools and community gardens are great places, making a contact with them um, to see if they can use wood chips. Some of them might be able to take a lot. Um, you might run into some issues with delivery and timing 
in some of that. Um, so, um, but yeah, that could be a good partnership. So then there's just taking it directly to homeowners. Now I'm, I'm sure everyone knows that like the easiest way to deal with the wood chips is to not put them in, in the truck or to leave them on the site, like just to chip them right on site. Um, that's going to be your trip cheapest option. Second to that would be to find another, some, a person nearby, a neighbor or someone who lives in the neighborhood who would take the wood chips for you. So that's what chip drop does. That's the service that chip drop offers. Um, like I said, most of the people who sign up for a chip drop delivery are just other homeowners. Um, and so there's pros and cons to all these options. And we'll go over, you know, some of these, uh, a little bit later on. Um, oh, and then the last option is take it home. So if you keep your wood chips or your logs on site, that could be an option for you. Maybe you process the logs into firewood um, or you mill it into lumber, whatever it is, um, you bring it all back to the yard. So that has its own costs associated and we'll try to cover that in this presentation as well. So first off, taking it to commercial sites, pretty straightforward, find a, um, municipal waste facility, a transfer station, or just a dedicated like green waste. Some of them are private, some of them are public, um, but you can call around and basically find places that will take your green waste. Um, things you should consider, what do they accept? Do they take everything? Does it have to be processed to a certain grade? Will they take logs? Um, when are they open? Timing is gonna be a consideration. Um, if your crew tends to work late and they close at, you know, 3, 4, 5 p.m., then that's going to be something you have to consider. Keeping the wood chips overnight and disposing of them the next day, you know, may just increase the amount of time that these wood chips are costing your crew money. The more you drive around with it in your truck, the more it's costing you money. So um, what's their rate? I know a lot of places in the country will take materials for free. And I also know a lot of those places change their rates. So places that were once free are no longer free. Um, that happens a lot or places are seasonal. So, you know, when there's a high demand for wood chips, uh, or mulch material, they may let you drop there for free. Um, but then if they don't, as soon as they don't need it anymore, or they fill up, they jack the rates up. So variable rates is something you want to want to consider. And is it closest and um, is it the most convenient um, to either your job or to your job, to your, um, your shop? Is, it, is there a place close by that's on the way home for the crew? <clears throat> and the other thing we want to talk about is uh, do they accept quarantine materials? So um, not all places accept quarantine materials. So um, I linked a little link for, this is a Portland website um, that addresses Dutch elm disease. Uh, and it talks about uh, quarantine procedures for, um, for elm. And so they go in here and you can go in here and talk, uh, see what the, this, they talk about pruning, uh, the rules for pruning in the city of Portland. And then they have a dedicated section for elm wood and how it has to be disposed of. Now these may be very similar to, you know, um, ISA approved procedures. So it may be very similar all around the country. This just happens to be the city of Portland's policy. So reading here, all pruned elm wood must be disposed of properly to prevent the spread of infection. Elm wood is not allowed to be stored as firewood. All elm wood must either be chipped or debarked and buried. And for more details, see the procedures for elm wood disposal. So um, if your city doesn't uh, have a specific elm wood or quarantine, and I'm just talking about elm wood here, but whatever the uh, the plant uh, or uh, disease is in your specific area, your, your city may or may not have a, a protocol, but there's also state um, uh, procedures as well. And the Oregon Department of Ag Agriculture has a specific section about that. And I just wanted to go through here and say, because they do specifically state, um, uh, commodities restricted within quarantine areas, um, the exception of commercially produced nursery stock, uh, here it is, 
are prohibited movement within or outside said areas except for the transportation of such commodities to locations authorized by the department for the burning, burial, or other approved method of disposal thereof. So Oregon State kind of has this vague uh, description saying um, authorized by the department. So you're allowed technically in the state of Oregon to deliver elm material to uh, authorized areas and what that means, I'm not sure. But all that was meant to be getting back to um, is your place, is the place, the commercial facility, a place where you're allowed to take these materials. So anyway, uh, that's something you definitely want to look into. And you could do that just by asking the facility itself um, or by, you know, calling your state Department of Agriculture and saying, hey, where can I, where can I take Elmwood? So, all right. So maybe you decide that for your operation, keeping the material is the best course of action. Uh, maybe you have a lot of space in your yard. You have a, a big yard. Um, um, so I think regardless of how much space you have in your yard or what you're going to do, you should have a plan for what are you going to do with it um, because it's going to grow and you're going to get more of it. Um, so you should have a plan for getting rid of it somehow, whether it's selling it, posting it for free. Um, how long is it going to sit in your yard? It's taking up space in your yard. So you need to consider that. Um, how much are you paying? for it, for the space that if this material is occupying, um, the space where the pile might sit or the logs might sit, you're paying, you're paying taxes and rent on that space, um, even if you already have it. Um, so, and you're gonna need machinery, machinery to move the material uh, once it's sitting in your yard. So all of that is gonna, you know, be a cost and expense for your company. And then, yeah, do you have a reliable way to get rid of it or sell it? Are you going to post it on Craigslist? Are you going to have another dedicated business uh, dedicated specifically to selling wood chips or firewood? And then again, quarantine materials, you need to make sure that your site is even allowed to keep the materials or is approved to process the materials um, that may be under quarantine in your state. So residential delivery, this is kind of the core product of chip drop again, um, and maybe the area that we have the most familiarity with. So things to consider if you're gonna deliver your wood chips or logs to another residential customer, how close is it? Um, proximity is a, is a huge cost. Uh, a truck and two crew members, you know, driving 30, 40 minutes uh, across town to empty a truck is a big expense. We're gonna go into the details of that later on. So proximity is huge. Does the person you're delivering the wood chip material to know what to expect? So this is a, a big area that chip drop focuses on. Um, Arborous wood chips are not like the materials that you would buy at either a bulk mulch facility or in bags from Home Depot. So is does the person know what they're getting? Do they know how much they're getting? Do they know there's going to be leaves in there? So um, at Chip Drop, we have this sort of expectations of service, we call it. It's an extension of our terms of service, but basically it's a plain English document that we created to basically set the expectations for homeowners and anyone signing up to get a delivery and say, um, this is not like bag mulch and this is what you should expect. So for a chip drop delivery specifically, we allow up to 20 cubic yards uh, in a single delivery. It doesn't have to be 20 yards. It could be as small as four yards, but basically anyone signing up for a chip drop delivery has to be ready for at, up to 20 yards. Um, some crews I know, especially in uh, California or other parts of the country operate like 30 yard trucks. And we basically just tell them they either have to split the load in that case uh, between two sites or they just don't fill the truck up all the way if they do want to use a chip drop site um, but if your truck is smaller or you know within 20 yards you can drop the entire truck load and the homeowner doesn't get the option to say hey i only want half a load or whatever the case may be so it's kind of limiting because not everyone can take 20 yards um, but it does let you um, 
be able to drop the entire truckload. So um, some other things we try to like um, set people up for uh, preparing their site is important. What sites are good sites? What sites are bad sites? You know, if you post an ad on Craigslist, like, hey, does anybody want some wood chips? You may get a lot of responses from people say, yeah, I'll take your wood chips. But then you show up and there's uh, maybe no driveway and it's not, you know, there's not a lot of room on the side of the road. It's just not a good site. So we give people kind of some best practices on how to make sure their site's ready for a delivery. Um, this is a big one. We try to let people know that there's gonna be leaves in the material and that leaves are okay. Um, you know, leaves turn brown eventually uh, they get sun washed, the material becomes eventually a uniform color, but when they first get the load and it shows up in their driveway, there's going to be some shock there uh, if they weren't ready for it. And, you know, we try to make sure that everyone's ready and is aware that, yeah, this is, this is an okay load. These are all pictures from actual people who had received uh, deliveries and were upset and we said, hey, this is actually okay. And, you know, sorry, but we're going to post the picture on the website just to hopefully make it as clear as possible. Pictures really don't do a great job, but they, it's better than nothing. So um, yeah, we try to put as many different pictures in here. And these, like I said, these are all pictures from unhappy past customers. Um, what's not allowed in a chip drop, we cover that. Um, logs aren't allowed unless the homeowner check the box saying they'll accept logs and there's different amounts of logs. You can also deliver entire loads of just logs. Um, that's its own checkbox. So, um, but yeah, if a homeowner doesn't request logs, then that's something that you can't have in there. Um, you know, rocks, um, unchipped brush. Uh, so basically like, <clears throat> you know, having like raked up after a job, you don't want to pass that material necessarily through the chipper. So there's inevitably going to be some amount of the material that can't be chipped. And so we put that on the homeowner to basically accept that. The caveat there is it does need to be uh, no more than 5% of the entire load. So that should get you one or two bucket loads of rakings at the end of the job. Um, you know, again, while you're raking up at the end of the job, there's going to be some stuff on the side of the road. Um, and so, um, but, um, but yeah. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, too much. Um, stump grindings are not allowed through chip drop. Um, this is something we've thought of offering, about offering, but um, unfortunately just the large amount of like dirt mixed with uh, wood chips doesn't make a great material that we've found yet that's easy to convince people to sign up to receive. Um, you know, there's lots of um, nerdy horticulturists that will take like any organic material, maybe they're making compost, but um, there's just not a lot of those folks. And so for chip drop, you know, since mulch application is pretty universal, mo a lot of yards have mulch in their landscaping. Um, it's a lot easier to, you know, get people to sign up for wood chips. So um, yeah, we for that reason, we do limit no stump grindings. Um, just a couple other things here. Yeah, palm. So palm is allowed. It just has to be processed. Um, I guess some people, some folks call it gorilla hair, but basically if you can, if you have a chipper that can gobble up that palm uh, material and turn it into something that could be used as mulch, then a uh, palm is totally allowed. Um, one of the things that homeowners are allowed to specify on chip drop is any species of material that they don't want. Um, so that's another caveat. And again, these are all, whether you use chip drop or whether you post an ad on Craigslist and, you know, try to find folks that way, or, you know, a homeowner runs out to your truck and is like, hey, can I have your wood chips? You, these are all things you're going to have to consider regardless, um, no matter how enthusiastic the person may be. You know, I remember this one scenario where uh, this nice lady that we, it may have been the neighbor or someone we were working for was um, wanted the wood chips and we're, we're like, okay. And showed her the back of the truck. Yeah, you sure? And as the truck was dumping out these wood chips, um, she just started crying <laughs> and she was just very distraught. I, I can't remember if it was the volume or, 
But, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure a number of you have been in a similar situation where it's just like, well, the chips are on the ground now. Uh, we tried to tell you. Uh, so, so all of this material on the Chip Trap website is to basically address that and prepare the folks. And as a result, a lot of people, you know, sign up and then cancel their request because they just decide it's too much of a risk um, for them or it's just not quite what they were looking for. Um, the cool thing is, again, with Chip Drop, where we're kind of filtering out all the folks who may not want this material, uh, is that the rest of the people are extremely enthusiastic and just beyond grateful for getting this material. So I feel like the world is kind of split uh, two categories of people, people who hate the idea of getting a, a delivery of wood chips from an arborist and just the people who are like so ecstatic and just love it. So there's no in between, there's no middle ground. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, at chip drops, you know, this is something we've kind of prided ourselves on is like making sure that the people who would be upset by getting a delivery do not sign up for the service. So something to consider again, uh, whether you're going to do it yourself or not. Um, I'm trying to think if there are more, uh, more consideration. Again, these are all the considerations uh, that are specific to delivering wood chips to a residential location. A lot of these don't apply if you're just going to go and uh, empty your truck at a commercial facility because, you know, they're dealing with people delivering materials all day long. So um, you still have to adhere to their rules, but it may be a little bit more, um, uh, I guess, reliable, for lack of a better word. Um, and you may just decide that that's easier, but um, but yeah. Um, all right, I think I pretty much covered most of what I needed to cover there. Um, all right, back to presentations. Yeah, expectations. That's I think that's a big one when um, delivering to residential customers is just making sure they know what to expect. Cool. Um, do you need to contact them before delivery with chip drop? You know, our rule is that you do not have to make contact with the homeowner. Um, they will get a notification once you sort of commit to drop in the app, um, but that'll just be by email and that'll give you basically a 48 hour window to make the delivery. So if you're doing the drop the next day, um, that should give you, you know, just that much time. Um, if you need to plan further in advance, like a week or so, then chip drop really isn't the best option because the homeowner is kind of expecting once they get that email that it's going to be there pretty shortly. Um, and to that end, some crews, you know, do prefer to like call or make contact with a homeowner beforehand. Certainly if you're rolling your own and, you know, soliciting for places to, to drop through Craigslist, you definitely are going to want to make sure to, if you're keeping a list of people who want wood chips, you're going to have to essentially call them when you have the material. And that's another difficulty. And actually another impetus for creating chip drop is just having this like clipboard with people's addresses and phone numbers and trying to like call them, you know, frantically uh, and get a hold of someone. So um, yeah, it's kind of up to you for chip drop though. Technically the rule is that you do not have to make contact ahead of time. Quarantine materials is a big one. Uh, we dealt with a couple of cases of elm logs that had been delivered and uh, we learned a lot through the process. Um, but yeah, you're gonna have to be on top of the game if you're delivering green waste materials to residential customers because they probably are not gonna know uh, and you don't wanna get you know stuck in a situation. Uh, so um, right-of-way access, um, actually, sorry, right-of-way, so, um, you know, we let homeowners decide where they want to request the material to be dropped off. And if they say that they want it dropped off on the side of the road in the front of their house, um, that's sort of on them and also on you um, as the, um, the company that's delivering the material. Um, you know, we get a lot of questions about this and a lot of friends or even myself driving around like, hey, like I see wood chips all over the side of the road, especially here in Portland where, uh, Chip drops pretty popular, um, and yeah. So this is another situation where each city has its own rules and um, um, regulations regarding right of way. So technically, um, as a it's on the homeowner. So the homeowner is allowed to in Portland 
block the right of way for a period of 24 hours, sort of like a temporary situation. And that's just basically in the area where a car would normally park. Um, I can't remember if that applies to the sidewalk or not, but um, yeah, I think the point is that each city has their own rules um, and a permit may be required. Uh, we had a situation recently where the tree company had, there was, there were two roads, this was a corner lot. One road was this huge wide residential lane, um, tons of room. And the other road was very narrow, no parking on one side, fire hydrant on the other side, not lit. So, and the homeowner had asked for them on the, the unlit narrower street, um, just cause that's, it was closer to their garden or whatever. And uh, anyway, that's where the tree company dropped them. Uh, and um, a car ended up hitting <laughs> the pile and totaling their car. And um, it doesn't happen very often, but it happens sometimes. And, um, you know, we determined that in this situation, the company made a bad call and, um, you know, poor judgment. And I think judgment is really key when you're, you know, emptying out your truck at this site that you've maybe never been to before. Um, you really have to use best judgment, just like you do on your clients that you do tree work for. So it's really no different, but um, yeah, you have to use best judgment. Um, and um, so, yeah. Um, quantity and quality. So we talked about quantity. Um, with chip drop, you can deliver your whole truckload. We pushed really hard to make sure that that was something that tree companies uh, could do because we knew it was important. We knew splitting the load really just was not practical. Uh, if you are delivering materials to, if you're doing like a Craigslist deal or, or finding places to drop on your own, this is something that might, you know, get you hung up. Um, you might say 20 yards, but they might not know what 20 yards is necessarily. So um, making sure they understand quantity. You, in, to that end, you may need them to actually be at the site, you know, to make sure they accept the whole truckload. Um, it's kind of up to you how you do that. But um, and then quality, we talked about quality. So uh, with chip drop, I didn't uh, surface this when we were on the expectations, but for chip drop, uh, the, we we specify that the wood chips themselves. Uh, should be no bigger than four inches. Um, so that's our sort of spec that we have created to say that like your wood chipper, chipper is morselizing this wood to a small enough <laughs> size that we can call it mulch. Um, and there's a huge range of, uh, and I know it depends on the plant species as well, but there's a huge range of chips sizes that can be created. And yeah, four inches, maybe a little bigger, but um, we do have a spec on there so that, you know, when we get pictures back and there's these big like planks, um, we can say, yeah, that's the homeowner can't use this material for, for mulch because it's not really a mulch. It's just kind of like, it's like kindling. Um, and so, yeah, something else to consider. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Um, customer support. So, uh, we're kind of hang, we're kind of sitting on this residential delivery section, um, for a long time, but it, it is a really cool thing. And I, the other, the other thing that, um, I think a lot of arborists, um, maybe are a little gun shy about when it comes to this, uh, the thing you don't realize is like homeowners, the homeowners who want this material are really excited about it. It provides a huge value, um, to plants and I wanted to um, share, let's see what you guys can see here when I click on this. So this is a website. Um, this person, um, her name is Linda Chalker Scott. She's a horticultural specialist. I think she did some presentations at the last ISA conference, but she has this cool site um, and she's been doing some research um, on what she calls like myths. Um, gardening myths or horticultural myths. Anyway, she has this whole section dedicated to mulches. And these are really cool reference materials, uh, if, whether you're familiar or not, just to check out. Um, because she really talks about why specifically arborist wood chip mulch or fresh mulch, you know, that's been gone straight from branches to chips 
is the best material for uh, for plants, for mulching, for plants, and also why it's so much different than what you can buy in the store. And there's just some cool articles in here. Uh, she talks about, um, let's see if it's this one here, pretty mulch. Um, yeah, this is the one where she talks about bark mulch and why bark mulch really is a terrible <laughs> mulch um, and is actually bad for your plants. Um, a few friends of mine who are arborists have you know, said when they go and visit sites and they're talking about plant health care with their clients, you know, they'll see bark mulch rings and maybe they're, you know, nicely spread and they're not burying the root crown, but just do some digging under these bark, bark mulch layers and there's no moisture. It's like a barren desert. Um, and then you go, you know, next door over and there's some fresh wood chips laid out and you go under there and it's just like teeming with life there's worms uh, there's all these microorganisms so it really like you know i'm it i don't tout as being like a wood chip nerd but it really is cool uh how much uh how much how much benefit um wood chips have wood chip mulch has to the soil and to plants it really is a cool thing so yeah this is a cool site um I'll, we'll add a link to some of these sites um, at the end of the presentation so you can go back and find them. Um, but yeah, they're cool uh, articles you can share with your clients um, or with folks who are talking with you about wood chips. Um, uh, yeah. So yeah, I'll, I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but, um, but yeah, um, the wood chips that are in the back of your truck are a hugely valuable resource. Um, it's another kind of um, strange dynamic of tree care industry where your business is producing uh, a waste material that's actually very valuable, which again, I think is very different from a lot of other industries. I don't know, maybe electricians produce a lot of uh, scrap copper, but, um, but yeah, you're basically creating a brand new product um, that you know really can just be given away um, and benefit a lot of people. So, um, yeah, that I was justifying why I went off on that tangent, but, um, uh, customer support is the last thing. So when things go sideways, when, um, the customer's not happy, when you drop, you know, the wood chips off and the person's very upset, what are you going to do? Definitely want to just like plan for the worst because it may happen. Um, chip drop, when you use chip drop, to sort of do this residential delivery. We pr provide first tier customer support. So any complaints you get, um, they may go straight to us by default. The, the homeowner may contact us first um, um, or they may contact you and you can always refer them back to ChipDrop. Um, just say, hey, you know, contact ChipDrop first. And we have a process for dealing with complaints. It's, it is common. Um, most of the time, it's just the person didn't read um, what they were signing up for. Um, we help them find ways to, you know, get rid of the material on their own, share it with their neighbors. They can post it on Craigslist. We kind of run the the gauntlet with them of this like trauma of like, oh, what have I done? Um, to like, okay, it's not that bad. Yeah, it's more than I wanted, but um, I did sign up for it. And yeah, so we kind of walk them through that. And then, so that's most of the time what happens. And then on the other end, um, there's actual situations where maybe there was damage to property um, or the truck delivered it to the wrong address. That happens as well. Again, we will do first tier support on that. We'll get all the information. We always ask for pictures. And then we basically just rope you back in if we need to, um, if there was an issue that we need your help fixing, so. So yeah. So a lot to consider um, on what you can do with your green waste. Ultimately, it's up to you, um, but how, what you decide to do with your green waste material is going to affect your bottom line. And so for the second part of this presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to try to like quantify what, how much it actually impacts our business. How can we quantify um, how the green waste we're handling impacts our business? To do that, we're actually going to create like a, a simple but pretty thorough financial model. Um, and it's not all related to green waste. We're going to kind of run the whole gauntlet. Um, and um, you're definitely welcome to follow along with the spreadsheet if you want to. Um, I'll provide a link to the 
financial model spreadsheet that we create here. Um, but you can kind of see in the presentation how we do some of these calculations. Um, and yeah, I think this was was kind of going back and forth on what this presentation should be about. Um, and while you know we're very passionate about the green waste material and how much it can save your business, I think just having a um, good understanding of how your expenses ultimately translate into kind of what I'm calling the bid rate. So um, depending on how you do bidding or you estimate jobs, um, you probably have a an hourly rate. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to use that hourly rate. Um, we're going to try to calculate that hourly rate using a very simple financial model. Um, before we get into it, a couple of side notes. If you are very financially savvy and you have a sophisticated financial model already, then um, yours is probably better <laughs> than what we're going to do in this presentation. But again, maybe there's some some points you can um, take away from here or just some uh, some ways about thinking about um, uh, yeah, your business finances. Um, if you're not thinking about business finances or you're shooting from the hip or, you know, you're going case by case basis and, um, you know, just trying to make base your bid off of like, what do I think this person is willing to pay? I think you could benefit a lot from what we're going to do here. Um, just being willing to think about your expenses, um, and put them down on paper and sort of quantify things is I think really make or break for, you know, either running your company into the ground or being successful. And if you do run your own business, you're doing it because you want to be successful. Um, even if you don't want to grow your operation, you want to be able to pay your own salary and have that independence. And so, um, this is a lot of this is just based off of my own experience running my own business. And, um, it is something that's really important and it's cool because it gives you control over, yeah, some sound kind of like uh, <laughs> highfalutin, but uh, your destiny basically. Um, yeah, when you have, when you know that you're gonna make money, when you know you can pay your bills, uh, when you know you can pay your salary, you know, you basically have control over, over yeah, the future of your business. So um, a couple things in here as well, sorry. I just want to make sure to cover, we're gonna, where this is going to be an extremely simplified model. Um, so it's going to make a lot of assumptions. And anytime we make an assumption, we're just going to make a conservative assumption with the end goal being, being that we don't want to lose money. Um, so if you, and it shouldn't matter if you do your bidding based on project or hourly. Um, the cool thing about this model that we came up with is that you can do, you can present your customers with whatever kind of uh, invoicing you want. If you just want to sum it all up and give them a total uh, project bid, you can do that. But knowing this hourly rate um, is just going to give you a really, um, what I think is like a really uh, objective kind of intuitive way to bid your projects. Because at the end of the day, you can look at a tree or a job and I think easily have an intuition for how long it's going to take. Um, and that intuition is good. Um, any estimator is going to have to do that. They're going to have to say, yep, it's going to take this much time and how many hours. And so all you need to translate that time is an accurate hourly rate. And so that's the number that we're going to work on the presentation. So let me pull this up. Okay, what's that looking like? Are you still seeing that, Kale? Screen share. Oh, Kale. There it is. Cool. So yeah, the goal of this is to try to fit um, all of our company expenses onto uh, one page. So in some ways, this might be, you know, overly simplified with too many assumptions. You may have to expand, expand this for your operation. Um, you might have to make them, you know, expand on this. But it starts with a very simple assumption. It assumes one crew. Um, 
it assumes that that crew is going to have, or yeah, the crew is going to be consist of a truck, chipper, um, two employees, some tools, and then it's also going to rope in um, some additional expenses. So to kick us off, there's going to be a couple of inputs here. Uh, and one of them is how many um, job hours or bid hours, I really should say bid hours, um, because we want to correlate this to how much work we're bidding um, and getting paid for. So how many hours uh, are we planning to do in a month? Um, so you can just start with a, a number. And then the other one is your salary. And this is important um, because you get to make it up and uh, you should definitely should consider it. And for any financial model, I think your salary um, should be its own line item, item expense. It should not be correlated to the company's profits. Um, you pay yourself first. So put that number in there, whatever you want it to be. Again, this can be a, a for purposes, it can be a, a, you know, a number that gets edited or changed. So the thing that we're going to do that is ultimately is find what is my hourly rate? This is the number we're trying to get to. And then what's going to come out of that is we're going to be able to see how each expense sort of plays into that hourly rate. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, uh, I'm, the hope here is that this is simple enough that anyone, folks who don't like math or whatever, this can be like simple enough that this isn't too painful. But not just that, this should be something you can like look at and get a snapshot of, you know, all of your expenses all in one place and get it down to this really usable, useful number and kind of play with that um, based on all these inputs. So let's just kick it off here. So. Um, this column here, we're going to call the hourly bid rate contribution. I'll call it HB contribution. And we'll start by saying there's a crew and we'll put two of them in here. And this one's pretty easy because uh, you pay your crew hourly anyways. So for this one, you can really just put um, the expense of a crew member to your company. Now, this isn't their salary or their hourly rate. This is the actual expense. So this should include uh, workers' compensation, Social Security, um, all that pooled together. But boil that down into an hourly number. Let's say $35 an hour for the crew. Cool. And this down here should be the sum of all of these that we create. Cool. So that was a pretty easy one because, again, you pay your crew hourly. Now, if you have salary crew, that'll be a little bit different. Um, we'll do a separate calculation that'll demonstrate that. But before we do that, let's do um, let's do the truck. So you own a truck. Let's say you paid cash for your truck. So if you paid cash or you own your truck outright, then um, um, or excuse me, yeah, let's say you own your truck that way, right. So the one way that you could estimate uh, your ex monthly or hourly expenses is um, to just do the cost of the truck. How much did you pay for it? Um, let's say you paid 35,000 for it, cool. And then in addition to that, we'll throw maintenance in here. Maintenance could be a per hour cost um, or it could be, you can rope it into uh, this cost as well. We're just going to throw it in here to make some of this a little simpler. So uh, if you can boil down all your maintenance costs, annual maintenance costs into uh, like a monthly amount, just divide whatever your annual maintenance costs are by 12. You can look at your past maintenance statements to get that number, but let's just put in a number here. Let's say we plan to spend about $250 a month. Cool. And that number, you know, may, again, these numbers don't get focused on the numbers here. It's just the point is we're creating like a little model and, and you can tweak this as much as you want. So in addition to this, um, uh, if you own your truck outright, then you're not paying a monthly uh, bill for a loan. So we're use depreciation to estimate what the, um, what the monthly expense is. Um, and it doesn't have to be the same depreciation um, that you use for your taxes. Depreciation is a, you know, is a known um, tax, 
tax term, and it, this doesn't have to be the same. The other way you could think about this is how uh, long do you want to take to recuperate the cost of your truck? So I'm just gonna put a number in here, let's say seven years. So then, let's see here. Oh, sorry, um, give me one sec. Okay, so this is gonna equal the annual cost is gonna, you know, I'm just gonna share my spread. <laughs> I did a, a pre-filled out spreadsheet here that I'm gonna walk through. The goal is to try to build the spreadsheet um, during the call, but I'm finding that that is a little too uh, difficult. So <laughs> I'm just gonna share the spreadsheet that I pre-made and cheat a little bit, and then I'll just walk you through it. Um, so let me pull this over here and let me make sure you can see that. Yep. Cool. Okay. I tried to make that work, but man, live spreadsheet editing, that was just a bridge too far. Okay. So um, this is the same spreadsheet. It's all pre-filled. And so I'll just kind of talk you through some of the assumptions I made here and um, we can do some demonstrations with it. So we have all of our individual expenses um, that we've itemized here. And one cool exercise I thought would be if you if you haven't done this exercise is just take a piece of paper and write down every expense that you might have, um, whether it's like bar oil or chainsaw fuel or whatever it might be, um, and just write it on a piece of paper. And then what you can do is you can come back to this model and say, okay, have I accounted for that expense? Um, and you can find a place to insert it. So for the chainsaw, uh, chainsaw was a line item that we put in here, and we basically said the cost of the chainsaw is $1,500. We paid cash for it. Um, over the life of the chainsaw, the entire life that we own it, we're going to spend $1,500 maintaining that chainsaw, and I want to recuperate the cost of the chainsaw after five years. So annually, this chainsaw is costing me $600. Monthly, that's $50. And then my hourly bid rate contribution, the amount that the chainsaw um, contributes to how much I should bid for a job is this number right here. And all I did was I divided this monthly cost by the total monthly job hours. So that's how I made that calculation. And that line item is right here for chainsaw. And what I added here in this column was a percent that this line item contributes to the total. So to do that, to make that calculation, I divided this number by this number. And if you're not familiar with spreadsheets, you can use this little dollar sign here um, uh, on the item that the total item that you want to stay fixed. And then you can just copy that down like that. And so this number will move and this number will stay fixed. I really apologize. I'm sure everyone on this call already knows that, but I figure I should cover everything. Um, I'm gonna share this model at the end of the presentation so you'll be able to access it. And again, just use it as a reference or use it straight up, plug in your own numbers. Um, so yeah, uh, the, I'm trying to think here. The So for the this model, um, for the truck and the chipper, uh, I assume that I, we had a loan out on those items. And so rather than using depreciation, I use the monthly bill. Um, it's a little bit simpler because you know how much you're paying monthly for those items. Um, in addition to that, I added a maintenance cost here, monthly maintenance for the truck. And then to get the hourly bid rate contribution, I added the monthly bill plus the monthly maintenance and I divided that by this monthly job hours here. So again, you may use, you may um, calculate maintenance as uh, you know more of like an hourly, like how much is the truck running, which may be more accurate. This is just an estimate. Um, and I think one thing that I've found is 
if you're willing to just even go so far as to make an estimate, um, most of the times you get pretty close. Um, and again, you can calculate this maintenance amount by going through last, in, uh, you know, historical invoices for maintenance and trying to figure out what that is. So the closer you can get, the better. But even in just estimating is is pretty good. So both the chipper and the truck were basically calculated the same way. I didn't put a maintenance amount in for the chipper, but you could do that. Um, and so there's two chainsaws on the truck. So those I just copied the same value. Gear I said was like brooms, rakes, buckets, all that stuff. Um, all I did was I just add, I just copied the chainsaw. Again, it's a guess. It's a pretty small amount. Um, Let's see here. So yeah, you can see here, these line items are only like less than a percent of the total, but um, it's still a good exercise to account for it. And yeah, I just made an assumption that the amount I'm gonna spend on all my gear is the same as one chainsaw. Um, again, it's just an assumption. I did the same thing for consumables. Consumables would be like, you know, air filters for a saw. It might be your saw blades. Um, if you didn't put those into your chainsaw maintenance uh, amounts, but yeah, just consumable materials, uh, gas, oil, that kind of stuff, maybe gloves for the crew. Um, I just copied the number for chainsaws there just for simplification, but you can make a separate block here and calculate that separately. So admin, rent, and that kind of stuff, these are your uh, fixed monthly expenses. Um, uh these are things that don't vary uh month to month with how you they aren't dependent on how much you work basically so your salary um your monthly salary i just took the annual salary from up here divided that by 12. Um, if you pay an administrative staff uh, rent for your shop business insurance uh, you can add more items in there um, and then basically it just came up with a total amount here uh, by summing all those up and then to get the hourly bid rate contribution which is what we're calling it I just divided this total amount by the job hours cool so profit for your company um, profit for your company is not the same as how much you make as a business owner so in this model I'm saying that profit is how much you want to have in the bank at the end of the year um, uh, how much you want, you could say how much you want to earn over the end of the year, but basically um, how much money uh, you're going to have extra so that you can buy the next truck, buy the next chipper, um, build up that nest egg to prepare for, you know, unexpected events, whatever it may be, but profit is its own line item. And this is just a number again that you get to make up. You could put that number up here if you want, if you want to be able to see that in a different location. But um, yeah, just, you know, that this is up to you and then um, to get the monthly profit um, just divide that number by 12 and then same thing as before to get that hourly bid rate contribution uh, divide the monthly by how many monthly job hours um, you're going to work and so i'll just kind of show you what happens here so this assumes um, that we're going to bid 100 we're going to get paid for 180 hours worth of work if I change this number um, to, let's say, 160, um, you can see what happens. The total hourly bid rate goes up. So if I only work 160 hours a month, I need to bid more on each job to cover my expenses. Whereas if I work more, um, I can charge less or I can charge the same amount and have more buffer. So buffer is always good. Um, and then if you're looking at this price, you know, you get down to the end and you're like, oh, I can't bid that much. That's crazy. Um, that's where you start optimizing. But I feel, I always, I find that when you build the model, it's always best to be conservative. So that way, when you're, you're inevitably going to be wrong on some of the numbers or the individual costs, but when you're wrong, it's to your advantage and you're not losing money. Um, and then again, if you look at this number and you're like, this is totally unreasonable, I can't bid this amount. That's when you start looking at all these expenses and you start changing the expenses. You don't just arbitrarily change the, the bid amount. So um, cool. 
a couple more line items here. So um, transit costs. This is like drive time to and from the job site. Um, and how do you account for that? You really want to account for everything. So your crew is driving to and from the, the job site. Again, this model kind of averages all your jobs. So some jobs are going to be more, some jobs are going to be less. This is a simple model. So, you know, where you make assumptions and you be conservative um, just to kind of get something on paper. So say it takes 40 minutes, that would be both ways um, of drive time. That's this many hours. And then the cost. So to get this cost, um, we had the two crew members driving in the truck. So we were paying their um, their hourly rate, but in addition, the truck costs an hourly rate to operate. Um, in this calculation, we just calculated the mileage, um, that, excuse me, the fuel costs, but you could also add a maintenance um, component in here as well. So I'll just kind of walk you through what we did. So I know the miles per gallon for the truck. I know the cost of fuel. I assumed an average distance for the job site. You could go back through your historical uh, job invoices and actually calculate how far your crew is driving um, on average and get a more accurate number. Always good to be conservative. Um, and then time, how long did it take? You can use, um, you know, usually the crews are going to be driving to and from the job site in, you know, the worst traffic hours uh, unless you're really early. Uh, or you start really early but um but yeah knowing this drive time is a huge component and so then once you have all those numbers you can get a dollars per mile by dividing the cost of fuel by the mileage um, and that will give you a dollar per mile number and then you can calculate miles per hour on average, and you do that by dividing the job distance by the average time driving. And I used minutes in here, so I need to divide that by 60 to get hours. Um, so this is miles per hour. And then from there, you can get per transit hour cost. And to get that number, you multiply this dollars per mile by miles per hour. And that gives you a dollars per transit hour. And again, this is just accounting for fuel. So it costs $30 to drive this truck for one hour just in fuel costs. So anyway, back over to the transit costs, we used that number. We summed up these two numbers and this number. So the two crew members and the truck both driving down the road for 40 minutes, and we multiplied that by the drive minutes here. And that gives you total drive cost. And then again, the thing we wanna know is what is that? Cause we're not, this isn't a more, you know, accurate and per job way to do things would be to say, oh, this job is gonna be, this job's farther, so it's 40 minutes away. So I'm going to noodle, you know, on these each individual number and come up with a really accurate price for this one job. Well, that's great if you have the time to do that, but wouldn't it be better just to sort of average all your jobs together and just pay everyone the same rate? And some jobs are going to be more, some jobs are going to be less, but in the end, you know, you're making money. Um, and again, you can change these numbers if you, if, you know, last year you're doing jobs that were really close by and now you're driving out to the suburbs to do jobs, you can crank this number up and your entire model changes, the whole thing changes. So you can update this, you know, in real time to get, to be more accurate. And over the years, you know, you can really hone this in to make sure that it's accurate. So anyway, uh, so this transit time here was added right here. And you can see based on percentage, this is five, transit time is 5% of my costs expenses really here we're calculating this hourly rate but really what this is saying is transit time is five percent five percent of my expenses to and from the job site cool that's a cool thing to know i would want to know that if i was operating a tree company all right so back to the point of this 
presentation, which was green waste management. Uh, how much does it cost to dispose of your green waste? Um, so we have a little section here for that. So I did a few options here because it can vary a lot. So dump one, dump option one, let's say you have a free site, but it's a long ways away. Okay, so the fee to dump there is zero dollars. Then I have these two line items here. This is setup and dump. So this is how long it takes to detach and reattach the chipper. All the nonsense, get the buckets out of the back of the truck. Dump is just that, just dump the chips. And I put 10 minutes in here and it's a decimal because I divided it by 60 so that it would be hours. So it'd be easier to calculate um, the rest of the stuff. But I put 10 minutes in there. We're literally, we're really accounting for every minute that we're paying for stuff. And so it's, it's cool to be able to like refine down to these like really low level. So anyway, I have setup and dump hours. They're the same across the board for, because these are, these are, this is time the crew has to spend no matter what, no matter where they're dumping it. Um, maybe setup might be a little bit more on some locations than others, but, um, but yeah, these happen to be same, the same across all the options. Drive hours is different. So this is a site for this option. This is a site that, sorry, Kale, okay, stop scanning my <laughs> screen back and forth. Uh, so this is a site that's far away. I said it takes half an hour to get there. Now you could get nerdy. We already have a transit cost here. This, this assumes that it's 30 minutes extra in addition to the normal transit time of the crew driving back and forth to the job. This model also assumes you fill the truck once every day, you empty at the end of the day. Again, lots of jobs are different. Um, if you're doing uh, lots of jobs where you have to empty the truck multiple times a day, then you know this, might, this model might not be conservative, conservative enough. Um, but if you are, you know, mostly only filling the truck once a day and sometimes not even once a day, maybe you only have to dump once every other day, then this is great. Um, this model works great because again, it's conservative. Um, um, yeah, your actual expenses will be less than what the model is, is showing. So, uh, anyway, for this dump location, which is free, but far away, total cost was $88. Uh, again, to calculate this hourly bid rate contribution amount, we just divided that total by, uh, uh, actually, sorry, in this situation, we didn't divide by um, monthly job hours because this is not actually a monthly cost. This is our daily cost because we're emptying our truck once a day. So this one's a little bit different. So um, careful here. So we divided this by eight because um, we said we work on average eight hours a day. Um, again, we're trying to get down to this like hourly bid rate. If eight is not the correct number, if your crew works on average nine hours a day, just kind of put that number in there. Um, but yeah, so we got this hourly bid rate and uh, green waste disposal. Oh, I have a different one in there, but if I say equals this, now you can see that my green waste disposal expense is 5% um, of my total expense dumping at this location. Again, I'm fascinated by this and I don't even operate a tree company. So this is just like really cool information. I had no idea what these numbers would be, you know, when I first created this presentation. Um, and yeah, 5% costs on transit time and green waste disposal is, those are huge numbers. Um, so I'd be trying to optimize those for sure. We'll just do dump option two here. I did a few here. Um, well, whatever, we'll just go through all, all of the options. So dump option two is a chip drop. So chip drops um, cost tree companies $20 per drop. So chip drop charges tree companies $20 to drop at any one location. Um, it's a one-time fee per drop. Um, so there's no subscriptions with chip drop. In general though, um, the tree companies that use chip drop pay less than that. So we have free sites where you can drop, drop as well. Um, that may be like, we don't charge in your city because your city is just getting off the ground. Um, although we do charge in most places in the country 
uh, now, but we don't charge in Canada, for example. So those are free. In this case, um, this would just be zero. But on average, um, uh, tree companies are paying less than $20. So we went through historical data and found that on average, most companies pay $14 per drop on average. So that's kind of cool. Our sticker price is $20, but we have ways that you can pay less. And in addition to that, if you want to pay nothing for a chip drop, you can just drop at the free sites, but obviously there's less of those. Um, um, so yeah, um, cool. So the chip drop site costs $14. The setup and dump hours were the same. And I said that this site was eight minutes away because that is the average amount of drive time that a tree company spent driving to their drop site. And that's based on historical data. So eight minutes is pretty close. So, um, which is cool. Um, so yeah, so the total cost was $54. And that hourly bid rate was 683. And if I go, sorry, I'm going to scroll again here, Kale. I tried to fit all this on the screen, on one screen, but I couldn't get, get it with all these dump options. So cool. Um, go back to the green waste disposal line item, and I'll change that to this. And you can see my green waste disposal expense went down from about a little over 5% to now a little over 3% and it dropped my hourly bid rate down. So kind of a cool way to look at things, look at your expenses. Um, this was actually really interesting to me. Um, so I did two other options. One was uh, an expensive drop, drop site. And in some cities, uh, you know, spending $150 to empty your truck is not unheard of. Uh, in Portland, I think it's close to that in some spots. And in California, I think they're paying well over that, maybe double that. So yeah, um, this is not a crazy number for some crews, but what did that actually like amount to? Um, and I just said that it was like hyper close, like on the way to the drive site, to the job site um, or back to the, the shop. And um, yeah, the, the hourly bid rate cost was $21 and um, if I uh, scroll back over, so if I say that equals that. So my green waste disposal fees now jump up to 10% on their own, just because of that huge dump fee, which is crazy. I, that, I actually wasn't expecting that. I thought, you know, high fees for dumping would actually be a much smaller percentage, but, um, but yeah, that was kind of interesting. And then this fourth model, so I'm going to scroll back over here. Um, this fourth model, we said, uh, I tried to do like a keep your wood chips model. This is kind of just a fun exercise. So the fee to dump to keep your own wood chips and logs is $0. Set up and dump time is the same because you still have to detach the chip, chipper and tip the truck. Drive hours is zero because you're driving back to the shop anyways. What's the total cost? So um, the total cost <laughs> is not just zero dollars because um, because you pay for that land. So um, so yeah, over here I did a little chip yard sub calculation. So I included a number for um, the amount we spent on rent for you know this kind of like wood chip or log management area. I put a number in there. So this is my monthly rent that I pay, and then the equipment to operate and move that mulch. If you've got a, you know, a mini loader or I don't know, an excavator or log splitting, whatever it is, um, if you have loans on those, that equipment, um, then, uh, then yeah, you have a payment. And so the per hour cost for, for this chip yard, um, let's see, I think it was just, yeah, it was just the sum of these monthly expenses. And again, if you own this equipment, then you might use the depreciation model here, kind of like we did in the chainsaw calculations. Uh, but I just assumed there was a loan and the rent obviously um, is a monthly expense. And then I just divided that by the job hours, monthly job hours. So that gave us a per hour cost. Um, and that's a fixed cost um, monthly. So then back to this, uh, keep the wood chips uh, rate over here. A, lot, a little more going on. Okay, so 
it's the crew, it's the sum of the crew. I hope I did the calculation right. Uh, sum of the crew's hourly rate times, oh yeah, times the hours that they spent, um, which is that, you know, they're spending that set up and dump time. Um, plus, then I have here, oh, the, I guess we did a fuel cost, but it's zero because drive hours is zero. So this actually is zero, the, the, the fuel cost for the truck times um, this zero comes out to zero. So there's no drive costs. And then, um, did I even include the, oh no, yeah. And then what's this zero one three? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Embarrassing, what is this? Oh, 13. Oh, it was the fee. Yeah, that's the fee. Okay, zero fee. Okay, great. So it was similar to how we did before, but then for the hourly bid rate, um, it was this uh, total cost here, again, divided by eight, because you dump once a day. But then I added this per hour cost. So my per hour uh, cost for keeping my wood chips is the per hour cost for just the dumping portion, as well as the per hour cost uh, for having the chipyard and the equipment to deal with it. So that's how I did that. I just added those two numbers together and it came out to this amount. And yeah, so this kind of ended up for this model. Again, I have no idea what it actually costs to operate uh, a wood chip and log processing operation, but um, you would put your numbers in here. And in this case, it ended up kind of like splitting the difference between, um, you know, uh, dumping at a free site far away and uh, an expensive site close by. It's kind of in the middle. Chip drop, still the cheapest option in this model. Again, um, your circumstances for your business are going to be specific um, to your business, obviously. So um, all this exercise was just meant to say these are things you should be considering. And hopefully it was kind of cool and interesting to um, kind of come up with this number um, this hourly bid rate. Um, and yeah, even if you don't use this to actually bid, you might find some useful information in here by like putting in your actual costs. And the thing I like about this too is again, it's it's one sheet. I like really simple when I'm considering, you know, important decisions for chip drop or my business, I need simple, small, few numbers to look at to make, you know, these decisions. I can't look at complicate, like my tax return, for example, does not help me know how to operate my business because um, they just aren't like, you know, practical numbers that I can, you know, that makes sense to me. So this is a cool way to, they're the same expenses. It's not fake data in here. Um, the same expenses, just a cool way to slice and dice it in a way that um, is useful. So yeah, hopefully you thought that was interesting and useful. Um, see if we got anything else here so yeah so if you uh got anything out of this exercise then you'll be making some money you'll be pretty stoked and um yeah that's the end of the presentation thank you very much uh for doing that brian hey uh could you get a uh share link to that uh Excel sheet so we can post that here. We've got a lot of people uh, asking for it. <clears throat> but cool. um, yeah, definitely yeah. can do that. Great. Thanks once again. Make sure that you check out Chip Drop. Uh, the website is getchipdrop.com. Um, does chipdrop.com just work? Chipdrop.com will work. Yeah. Um, yes, okay. you can use chipdrop.com. It will redirect to getchipdrop.com. Both will work. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for watching. The uh, the quiz link is currently in the chat. Uh, it will be in the description for the video later. If you take that and get 16 out of 20, you'll get two CEUs. Otherwise, um, if you take it in a couple days, you'll still get one CEU. Uh, these videos will live forever. Um, online on Facebook and YouTube, and you can come back to them and 
uh, you can watch it again, you can take the quiz again, uh, and get a free CEU. So I am about here to post this link that he just sent me. Um, and uh, everyone have a nice night.